you're all well. For tonight, we are returning to the ufology series. We have a lot of ground to cover in this recording, so I'm going to mostly dispense with the pleasantries and get right into it. I promised this episode a while ago after we discussed the UFO phenomenon in the 21st century. I recently reread a book entitled The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry, by Dr. J. Allen Hynek, and it inspired me to speak a little more on the man who is one of the most important ufologists of all time. We've discussed Dr. Hynek before, but never in any depth. So this evening, we're going to start by briefly discussing his life, credentials, and personal experiences with the UFO phenomenon, before covering his close encounter index with some examples. Then we're going to finish up with Dr. Hynek's philosophy and recommended methodologies for investigating UFO incidents. It's a lot to get through, so let's begin. Joseph Allen Hynek was a child of Chicago, Illinois, born on May 1, 1910. He attended college at the University of Chicago and Yerkes Observatory, eventually earning himself a Ph.D. in astrophysics. After getting his doctorate, he joined the staff at Ohio State University, where he eventually rose to full professor teaching astronomy. But then, with the outbreak of World War II, Hynek sought to do his part. Though thanks to his education, he was more valuable behind the front lines in a laboratory than he was toting a rifle on the battlefield. He joined Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory, where he contributed to the invention of a revolutionary technology, the proximity fuse. This was a tiny radar module which could be placed at the head of an artillery shell. The advantage was that the tiny radar could detonate the shell as soon as it came within a given distance of its target, which was much more effective than relying on temperamental timed fuses. This enormously improved the efficiency of Allied anti-aircraft ordnance as well as their artillery. Over 20 million proximity fuses were made and deployed during the war. But after the war, Hynek returned to Ohio State, where he rose to be the director of the university's Macmillan Observatory. This is where Hynek was when he was approached by the Air Force to consult on their UFO investigations. We've already covered projects Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book in some depth in the first part of this ufology series, so I'm not going to retread the whole story. But suffice to say that the Air Force had become interested in UFOs following spates of sightings all across the country. Hynek was approached to serve as a scientific advisor. These investigations were based out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, and Hynek already held a security clearance thanks to his work during the war, so he was a natural choice. But up to this point, Hynek had never taken an interest in UFOs. In the UFO experience, Hynek states that he had laughed along with many of his colleagues at alleged UFO sightings. He didn't think that there was anything worthy of genuine investigation to the phenomenon, but he reasoned that joining the Air Force effort might provide a useful opportunity to debunk the phenomenon and educate the public on scientific modes of inquiry. He accepted the job and thus began what would eventually draw out to roughly 20 years as a consultant to the Air Force. Hynek's job as part of Project Sign was to assess UFO reports as they came in and attempt to find astronomical or other natural explanations. Over the course of one year, Hynek evaluated 237 cases. In the vast majority of them, he was successful in finding an explanation. But there were a select set of cases, roughly 20%, that eluded a count. And this gradually began to make Hynek wonder if he had been wrong to dismiss the UFO phenomenon out of hand. Here, I need to pause for a moment and offer a correction to a mistake I made in the first ufology episode. In that recording, we discussed a rumored document that was produced shortly before the end of Project Sign. It was supposedly called The Estimate of the Situation and it was prepared by a number of sign personnel who believed that some UFOs may have comprised technology that was not of human origin. The Air Force has never acknowledged the existence of this document, and a copy of it has never been made public, leading some to believe that it's a mere myth. But I mistakenly said in our introductory recording that the only source that claims the estimate was real is a book written by Captain Edward Ruppelt, who ran a later Air Force investigation. This is false. Dr. Hynek also corroborates the existence of the estimate in his book, though he doesn't explore it in any detail. Regardless, I thought it was important to make that correction. Project Sign ended in the late 40s and was replaced by Project Grudge, which accomplished next to nothing outside of flippantly dismissing UFO cases with little to no investigation. Hynek later said that Grudge, quote, took as its premise that UFOs simply could not be, end quote. He further admits that he had almost nothing to do with Grudge. But then came Project Blue Book in 1952, which, under the leadership of Captain Edward Ruppelt, managed to function as an actual investigation for a couple of years. Ruppelt took his job seriously, and he allowed Hynek to resume his job evaluating UFO reports. 
They even conducted a statistical analysis of UFO data with the help of the Battelle Memorial Institute. Ruppel wrote of Heineck in his own book, the report on unidentified flying objects, quote, Dr. Heineck was one of the most impressive scientists I met while working on the UFO project, and I met a good many. He didn't do two things that some of them did, give you the answer before he knew the question, or immediately begin to expound on his accomplishments in the field of science, end quote. But the glory days would end with the Robertson panel, an audit of Blue Book headed by the CIA, which determined that UFOs posed no threat to national security, and that it was a waste of time expending resources studying them. Instead, Blue Book became a public relations campaign for the debunking of UFOs. Officially, the reason for this was to quell public anxieties about space invaders, and thus deny the Soviet Union a pressure point to stir up civil panic. Captain Ruppelt left the project shortly after the Robertson panel. Heineck, however, remained on board after Blue Book went the way of grudge, even as the staff of Blue Book treated him more as an inconvenience than a partner. He became thoroughly disillusioned with Blue Book's methods after this point, citing that they were uninterested in actually investigating UFO cases, and were overly eager to offer any plausible explanation regardless of its veracity. Even worse, it became official policy to only publicly speak on cases which had been identified as having some sort of natural cause, while unidentified cases were forbidden from public release. Nevertheless, Heineck stuck with the project. He wrote later that he stayed on board mostly out of his own fascination with the UFO phenomenon. Quote, Blue Book had the store of data, as poor as they were, and my association with it gave me access to those data. End quote. But even though Blue Book had essentially abandoned scientific rigor, Heineck was still struck by the number of cases wherein seemingly credible, trustworthy witnesses were reporting extraordinary events. He marveled at how truthful they all seemed. Most of these people were not known to be delusional, or even to have any interest in UFOs at all. What's more, the majority of them were known to be trustworthy folks. Could they all be lying or hallucinating? Blue Book officially ended in 1969, ending also Heineck's association with the Air Force. But by this point, he was a changed man, thoroughly convinced that UFOs were a topic which deserved honest scientific scrutiny. His philosophy on UFOs centered around a fundamental question that is different from what many in the field ask. In the UFO experience, he breaks down this question very thoroughly, but it can be summed up thusly. Do some UFO reports constitute new empirical observations which cannot be explained by the current understanding of science? In short, Heineck noted that there were credible UFO cases that seemed to defy a scientific explanation given our contemporary understanding of the universe. If this could be established beyond doubt, that investigation could begin to determine how these cases could be reconciled with the broader understandings of the sciences. He compares UFOs to meteorites in the book, stating that there was a time when many people did not believe that stones could fall from the sky, but nevertheless there were reports and some evidence of just such things happening. Stones from the sky could not be justified within the scientific schema of that day, but further investigation eventually proved beyond doubt that meteorites do exist. Reports of stones falling out of the sky did in fact constitute new empirical observations, and that eventually the phenomenon was understood thoroughly enough to be added to the scientific canon. But in the case of UFOs, it had to be first proven that some UFOs constituted such new observations. Heineck then spends most of the book laying out the case that some reports may. After leaving the Air Force behind, Heineck continued to work on UFOs, penning a number of books on the subject, including one co-authored with another famous UFO researcher, Jacques Valli. He then went on to found the Center for UFO Studies, a private organization which he hoped would serve as the nucleus for a community of scientists to come together and give the UFO phenomenon the attention he believed it deserved. In November of 1978, Heineck even delivered an address to the United Nations General Assembly's Special Political Committee, wherein he pitched a centralized UN body for the investigation of UFOs, though unfortunately he was unsuccessful. Outside of UFO work, Heineck also continued to work as an astronomer, joining the Smithsonian Astrophysical Laboratory where he helped implement a system of satellite tracking cameras before he became the chair of the astronomy department at Northwestern University. But on an interesting UFO-related note, Heineck was also contacted by none other than Steven Spielberg, for whom Heineck served as a consultant on the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He even makes a cameo appearance of the alien mothership lands. That movie is named after an indexing system Heineck developed for UFO classification. We've discussed it before, but we're going to go over it in greater depth here tonight, as it constitutes a major component in Heineck's legacy. In the UFO experience, Heineck broke down UFO encounters into six categories. Daylight disks, 
or UFOs seen from a distance during the day, nocturnal lights, or UFOs seen from a distance during the night, radar visual encounters, wherein eyewitnesses see something inexplicable in the sky, which also appears on radar, and then three types of close encounters, wherein the witness comes into close contact with the UFO. A close encounter of the first kind is defined by visual contact at close range, whereby detail can be made out. The second kind is defined by close visual contact that is accompanied by observable effects in animate or inanimate material. This could mean impressions in the earth or reactions observed in animals. It could also be disruptions in machines or burnt and disturbed vegetation. The third kind is the most elusive. A close encounter of the third kind is defined as any UFO encounter wherein the witness reports seeing occupants in or about the craft in question. I now want to briefly cover one example case from each of the close encounter types to better illustrate what they are, as well as to showcase some of Hynek's most interesting cases, ones that seem to defy conventional explanation and may well provide us with new empirical observations. We'll start at the beginning with a close encounter of the first kind. On the night of the 16th of April, 1966, two police officers from Portage County, Ohio, were responding to a car accident on an isolated stretch of roadway. Deputy Sheriff Dale Spower was in the driver's seat, and he was accompanied by Mounted Deputy Wilbur Neff. The accident in question was a single-car crash. A lone motorist had lost control and slammed their vehicle into a roadside utility pole. When Spower and Neff arrived on the scene, they quickly sent for an ambulance to carry the driver to the nearest hospital, as well as a tow truck to remove the car. Once this was done, they sent for a repairman to come out and fix the damaged pole. With the situation well in hand, the two policemen overheard a report on the radio from dispatch, noting that a woman in neighboring Summit County had called in a report of a large lighted object in the sky, which she said was, quote, as big as a house. Spower and Neff placed zero confidence in the report, and apparently had a good laugh over it before they left the repairman to finish his work and set out on Route 224. While they were making their way down the road, they spotted an abandoned car on the south shoulder. Spower pulled over to make sure everything was all right, and both policemen promptly exited their vehicle to investigate. But while they were approaching the car, something emerged from over the trees behind them. It was an object of some sort, which emitted a blinding light. Upon seeing it, both Spower and Neff raced back to their vehicle, where they called dispatch on the radio. Outside, the light had begun to move, and after a brief exchange with dispatch, the two policemen set off after it. They proceeded to chase it for nearly 70 miles, sometimes accelerating to speeds close to 105 miles per hour. But Spower and Neff were not the only ones to see the object. Officer Wayne Houston, who was on duty in East Palestine, Ohio, was listening to the radio chatter from the chase as it played out. He caught sight of Spower's car chasing the light at a range of about 5 miles. He reported that the UFO appeared to be between 800 and 900 feet off the ground, and that it looked like an ice cream cone with the top melted down. When he saw Spower and Neff, Houston elected to join the chase himself, and he took off after his fellows. Eventually, the two police cruisers chased the object across the Pennsylvania state line, where a fourth observer also saw the object and the trailing police cars. Officer Frank Panzanella was parked in his car when he saw the object as well, and he described it as appearing like half of a football. He estimated it to be approximately 1,000 feet in the air. When he called his own dispatcher to report what he had seen, he was asked if he was sick. But he responded that if he was sick, then so too were the other officers engaged in the chase. It was at this point that the object began to gain altitude, rising up on the left side of the moon before it shot straight up and vanished. Hynek describes this tale as the wildest recorded UFO chase, and I have a hard time disagreeing. The case was reported to Blue Book, and a perfunctory explanation was provided. It became the position of the Air Force that the officers had started out chasing a satellite visible in the sky, but had then shifted their focus onto Venus. Hynek disagreed. He noted that there should not have been any satellites visible in that part of the sky at that particular time, and that furthermore, some of the witnesses reported seeing both Venus and the object in the sky at the same time. Additionally, the reports that the object rose up on the left side of the moon contradict the Venus hypothesis, as Venus was visible on the right side of the moon that night. Heineck also takes care to showcase Blue Book's lackadaisical methods, stating that Major Quintanilla, who was then head of Blue Book, was initially content with a brief phone interview with only one witness before issuing an explanation, and that it was only following pressure from a member of Congress who took interest in the case that he finally conducted proper interviews with all of the witnesses. I have a hard time rationalizing any sort of explanation for this case. 
There was no engine noise reported to indicate a helicopter of some sort, nor does the average helicopter look like a partially melted ice cream cone. And then we come to the puzzle of its mysterious departure, shooting straight up into the air. There's no vehicle from 1966 that I can think of that could pull off a maneuver like that. We can rule out some kind of hallucination, given that there were at least five separate witnesses. Usually, this is the point where I would consider that we were dealing with a hoax of some kind. And while it can be entirely ruled out, I think it's unlikely. The five witnesses Heineck reports would have to have been in cahoots with one another, and there seems to be no social connection between them at all. Though there was an article published in the Daily Kent State newspaper on October 18, 1966, which claims that a number of students from Kent State were responsible for the incident. The paper claims they got their hands on a weather balloon, which they outfitted with lights and released over the area. However, there are problems with this explanation. First, a balloon cannot account for the object's reported behaviors, such as shooting straight up in the air and disappearing. And reports on the wind speeds in the area that night are far lower than the velocity of the object as reported by the witnesses. The one piece of evidence which may go in favor of this explanation would be the reported shape of the object. Granted, it's not a spheroid as is common among weather balloons, but balloons can come in various shapes, and if this particular balloon was not fully inflated, I could see how a tapering outer skin could conceivably take on a conical shape which may appear like a partially melted ice cream cone or half of a football. Deputy Sheriff Spower personally rebuked this explanation, stating directly that what he saw did not appear or behave like a balloon, and I also find it suspect that I can find no other documentation backing it up. The article also claims that the balloon was lit with a bicycle light, which I don't think explains the intense brightness that was described by the witnesses. With all of this taken into account, I can't offer a definitive explanation, and neither could Heineck. This case constitutes a close encounter of the first kind because the object was seen at close range, near enough for detail to be made out, but it had no apparent other effects on the environment around it, nor were there any occupants reported. Next on the list is a close encounter of the second kind, wherein a UFO has some sort of observable effect on the environment around it. On November 2nd, 1957, Patrolman A.J. Fowler was on duty manning the phones in the police station in Leveland, Texas. At around 11 p.m., he received a peculiar report over the phone. He was called in by a truck driver named Pedro Salcedo, who had been driving with another man named Joe Salas about four miles to the west of Leveland, when a brightly lit, torpedo-shaped object rapidly closed with their truck from ahead. When it passed over the top of them, the engine on the truck died and the headlights cut out. Pedro described the object as being roughly 200 feet long, yellow-white in color, and he estimated it as having traveled at 600 to 800 miles per hour. Once the object was gone, the engine started again, and the two men were able to drive away. At the time, Fowler figured that Pedro may have been intoxicated with something, and had thus hallucinated the whole experience. But that assumption would be thoroughly shaken over the course of the next few hours, as more calls very similar to Pedro Salcedo's would continue to roll in. Roughly an hour later, another caller, identified in Heineck's book as only Mr. W, reported driving roughly four miles to the east of Leveland, when he had an encounter very similar to the one reported by Mr. Salcedo. Except Mr. W reported that the object was egg-shaped rather than torpedo-shaped, and that instead of bearing down on him at incredible speed, he came upon it resting motionless in the road. Like Salcedo, he estimated it to be roughly 200 feet long. As his car approached it, the engine died, and the headlights winked out. Then, in a fit of either courage or foolishness, Mr. W exited his car to get a better look. But when he did, the object rose up off of the roadway about 200 feet in the air before it went dark, vanishing from sight, after which point Mr. W was able to start his car again. This was followed by a third call from about 11 miles north of Leveland, where a sighting identical to Mr. W's was reported. Then a separate report that was filed with Blue Book revealed that at approximately 12.05 a.m., a freshman student from Texas Tech was driving about nine miles to the east of Leveland when his engine cut out unexpectedly and his car rolled to a stop. He got out and popped the hood, finding nothing wrong with the car's workings. But it was then that he spotted a long, lit object, which he estimated to be 125 feet long, resting on the road ahead. He said that it glowed a bluish-green color. Startled, the student got back in the car, but it wouldn't start. He then watched the object for several minutes before it rose into the air and vanished, at which point his engine turned over just fine. Fowler received another call at around 12.15 which reported another incident identical to the Mr. W sighting. 
At this point, Fowler was convinced that there was actually something afoot, and so he alerted the sheriff, who dispatched a number of police cars to comb the area surrounding Leveland for anything strange. As this operation was getting underway, another sighting occurred, though it was not reported to the police until the following day. West of Leveland, near the spot where Salcedo reported having seen the object, another truck driver said that he saw a bright orange light in the distance, which came closer before setting down on the highway and, you can probably fill in the rest by now, shut down his truck's engine and lights. About a minute later, the thing rose up into the air, went dark, and vanished, leaving the truck operable again. However, this report also included a potentially important detail, which may account for the variance in color between the various reports. This witness said that the object appeared red-orange when in the air, but that when it set down, it changed color to a bluish-green, before returning to its more fiery hue as it lifted off again. Another call came in from another truck driver at 1.15 a.m. Once again, the details were nearly identical to the Mr. W. sighting. By 1.30 a.m., Sheriff Clem and a number of his deputies were out scanning the region for signs of the marauding UFO. He was riding in a car with Deputy Pat McCullough when they both spotted an oval-shaped red light moving in the distance. Clem described it, quote, like a brilliant red sunset across the highway, end quote. The light approached the car, drawing within 300 to 400 yards of it. The car's occupants reported that it shone brightly enough to light up the road in front of them for about two full seconds. There was a second police car trailing a few miles behind Sheriff Clem and Deputy McCullough, manned by patrolmen Lee Hargrove and Floyd Gavin. They corroborated the testimony from Clem and McCullough, stating that they also saw the oval-shaped object pass near the sheriff's car. Later, another police officer named Lloyd Ballen of Anton, Texas, reported seeing a flash of light moving east to west in the distance, in the same direction as Clem and McCullough reported. Leveland Fire Marshal Ray Jones also took part in the search effort, and he reported seeing a streak of light pass over his car while the engine stuttered and the lights flickered, though neither of them cut out completely. All in all, 15 phone calls reporting strikingly similar incidents flowed into the Leveland Police Department that night and into the following morning. Officer Fowler said afterwards that all of the witnesses seemed very agitated, some of whom were downright disturbed by what they had seen. Blue Book at that time was led by Captain Gregory, who did call for Hynek as soon as the report came in. However, Hynek was very busy at that time tracking a Russian satellite which had been launched the day before, and so he did not immediately dive into the minutia of the case. After hearing only the basics of the reports and being told that there was an electrical storm active in the area, Hynek offered a quick explanation of ball lightning. However, after taking the time to review the case in detail, Hynek realized the full strangeness of the events. He also found out that the reports of an electrical storm were incorrect. It was overcast, and there was some mist in a few areas, but there was no reported lightning anywhere in the region that night. And even so, ball lightning is not capable of selectively killing car engines. Like the last case, I have no plausible explanation to offer. The way I see it, this is either a very compelling case of the unexplained, or this was one of the best coordinated hoaxes of all time, including multiple members of the police, many civilians with no apparent social connections, and even a police officer in a separate town. This is considered a close encounter of the second kind because of the observed effects in the vehicles. We've got one more type to cover, and it is definitely the strangest. For our third kind encounter, we're going to discuss the rather famous Lonnie Zamora sighting. Lonnie Zamora was a police officer for Socorro, New Mexico, and he was a man with a reputation for being entirely serious, almost to the point of humorlessness. At 30 years old, Lonnie was the bane of the teenage population of Socorro, given that he had a particular knack for busting them as they rocketed their newly acquired automobiles down the street. He took his job very seriously. And in the late afternoon of April 24, 1964, when Lonnie was chasing one such speeder down the highway south of Socorro, the offending vehicle turned off onto a primitive road that branched off into the desert. Lonnie wasn't about to give up his target, so he kept close on the offender, until he was distracted by a rumbling noise in the distance. Lonnie became concerned that he was hearing an explosion from a nearby explosives facility, so he broke off the chase and began to move toward the sound. Against the setting sun in the distance, Lonnie caught sight of an object descending out of the sky on the horizon, but the object was stolen from sight quickly afterward, as the terrain is very hilly out that way. He didn't get another look at the thing until he crested another hill. The roar had stopped by this point, but there was something visible on the ground in a shallow gully nearby. At first, he thought it was an overturned car. It was a white, oval, or egg-shaped craft resting on four legs, 
but beside it, he saw two humanoid figures standing near the craft, dressed in white coveralls. These two figures apparently saw Lonnie's car and acted as though they were startled. But Lonnie didn't get long to look at them as his car pulled behind another rise. And when the object came back into sight, the figures were gone. With the craft back in view, Lonnie stopped his car and got out for a better look. He drew within less than 150 feet of the thing, noting a strange symbol on the side, but then a series of loud thumps emitted from the craft which sent Lonnie scrambling back toward his car. Looking over his shoulder as he retreated, Lonnie saw the object lift off of the ground with a cone of flame ejecting out of the bottom before it rose about 15 feet into the air and began to move horizontally, disappearing into the distance. Lonnie was shaken by what he had seen, and he immediately called for a friend of his who was a sergeant with the New Mexico State Police, Sam Chavez. As Chavez raced toward the site, Lonnie drew the symbol he saw on the craft. When Chavez arrived, he noted that Lonnie was agitated, and also that there was some physical evidence left over from what Lonnie had seen, including indentations in the dirt and some charred plant life in the area. Eventually, a report made its way to Blue Book, and Hynek flew out to investigate. He conducted long interviews with both Lonnie and Sam Chavez, during which time he tried to find inconsistencies in the story or reasons to distrust either man. But Hynek came away thoroughly impressed by both men, though most notably with Lonnie. He wrote, quote, I was impressed by the high regard in which Zamora was held by his colleagues, and I personally am willing today to accept his testimony as genuine, end quote. Hynek also investigated the scene, where he was able to confirm the impressions from the landing legs and the damage to the plants. He also noted that the four impressions met each other at almost perfect right angles, referring to a geometrical theorem which states that if the diagonals of a quadrilateral intersect at right angles, then the midpoints of the sides of the quadrilateral lie on the circumference of a circle, he was able to determine that the center of that circle coincided almost perfectly with the largest burn mark on the ground. This is significant because it means that the burn mark lay directly beneath what would have most likely been the center of mass of a symmetrical craft of a nearly round shape, like the one Zamora described. This went a long way toward corroborating Zamora's story. Heineck was also able to dig up a few witnesses who saw an ellipsoidal UFO in the sky that day, as well as one who witnessed Zamora chase the speeder out of town. It's very much worth noting that Socorro, New Mexico is located just a few miles north of the White Sands Proving Ground. It's been considered by quite a few investigators that what Zamora saw was some sort of experimental craft that was being tested at White Sands and possibly miscalculated a landing. The Air Force denies this, but I've learned to always take their word with a hefty helping of salt. Personally, the thing Zamora reported reminds me of a lunar lander of some kind. This was just five years before Apollo 11 touched down on the moon. Surely it's possible that there were prototype landers being tested at White Sands. I don't think we can rule out that it was some kind of experimental spacecraft or aircraft that Zamora saw, but so far no record of an experimental craft matching Zamora's description has turned up. Blue Book ended up filing it as unidentified, and thus the case persists to this day. After his investigation, Heineck wrote in his final report on the case, quote, It is reports such as these to which I feel more attention should be paid. It is easy to dismiss the cases of birds, balloons, meteors, and the like, but when good citizens of average or better-than-average intelligence, and above all, sincere citizens, report something puzzling, I think we have some sort of social obligation to do as good a job on it as we can. End quote. This is a close encounter of the third kind because of the figures Zamora briefly saw. Hopefully, these three cases have given you a better idea of how Heineck's classification system works. To end this recording off, I want to discuss the methods which Heineck suggests should be used to investigate UFO incidents. One of the final chapters in the UFO experience lays out Heineck's opinions regarding how ufological research should be conducted, and I've boiled his advice down to six main points. The first point Heineck stresses is that the problem must be clearly defined before useful research can be pursued. Instead of simply flinging hypotheses about, claiming aliens or interdimensional entities or some kind of natural phenomenon, we must first decide exactly what needs to be explained. Across all of the reported cases which have been properly evaluated by relevant experts and investigated fully, but which still evade explanation, what strange factors need to be explained? Which of these factors appear the most often? Heineck argues that before we can begin to question what these inexplicable UFOs are, we must first answer this more fundamental question. What makes them inexplicable? This leads quite nicely into the second point, Heineck suggests that the best way to answer this question, and the wider question of whether or not UFOs constitute new empirical observations, is to conduct large-scale statistical analyses. 
You'll recall that Heineck had one of these done when he was working with Blue Book, the analysis conducted by the Battelle Memorial Institute. But that analysis remains to this day as the largest of its type in history. Analyses like these are critical because they allow us to establish patterns. Heineck suggests searching for patterns regarding color or color shifts, as well as the shape of the reported objects. He suggests breaking down how many objects appeared on the ground or in the air, as well as how they can be sorted via the Close Encounters Index. Finally, and perhaps most obviously, geographic and seasonal distribution should be plotted as well. Before one of these studies is conducted, the raw data must be very carefully curated. The cases involved must all be cases which have no natural explanation. To determine this, relevant experts must be contacted to consult and offer their opinions. Additionally, each case must be thoroughly investigated to ensure that we know as much as is possible about each one. Once this is done, and the cases which come from questionable sources or have likely natural explanations have been culled, the research may commence, including inter- and intracategory correlation studies to establish relationships between the various recorded features. What color is the most common among UFOs seen at night versus during the day, for example? It may not sound overly romantic or exciting, but that's the nature of research. Data collection and data processing may not be glamorous, but it is without a doubt one of the best tools we have at our disposal. In addition to these statistical studies, Heineck suggests conducting deep dives into singular multi-witness cases. He writes that ideally an organization which would be able to do this would have an immediate reaction capability, whereby properly trained investigators could be dispatched immediately when a report is delivered. These investigators should focus on collecting specific evidence and detailed testimony. Heineck states that a skilled interviewer can take vague statements made by a witness and either ask follow-up questions or couple that testimony with other evidence to derive much more detailed and thus useful information. As an example, he says that a skilled interviewer can take a statement like, it disappeared quickly, and convert it to, it accelerated within one second to an angular speed of 10 degrees per second and disappeared into cloud cover in the west-northwest. This specificity should always be the goal of the investigator. When coupled with the statistical data, ideally on a global scale, this information would go a long way toward deciding whether or not some UFOs constitute new observations. The fourth suggestion Heineck makes is for research specialization among the various investigators. Heineck admits that this probably sounds strange at first, but he then goes on to name a number of potential subdisciplines in which an investigator could specialize. Experts in flight mechanics could better evaluate the aerodynamic behavior of a UFO. Ground-marking specialists could analyze and categorize impressions left behind by objects on the ground, like those left by Lonnie Zamora's craft. Experts on the spectral characteristics of nocturnal lights can better assess UFOs seen in the dark. These experts would also need to be well-versed in common natural explanations for reported phenomena, so that the cases of misinterpretation could be quickly ruled out. The fifth point seems fairly obvious, but is critically important nonetheless. Hunt down every shred of evidence. Leave no stone unturned. Interview every witness thoroughly. Heineck saw this rule get trampled over and over by the Blue Book staff firsthand during the duration of that project, and he is adamant that time should be no object when struggling to find and follow every lead. And finally, the sixth point. Keep meticulous records. This is another fairly obvious one, but records are critical for ongoing research efforts. Do not let anything be forgotten. It was Dr. Heineck's hope that this research could be carried out by some kind of international organization, what Heineck refers to as the Invisible College, a fraternity of scientists and researchers dedicated to the scientific evaluation of the UFO problem. This was supposed to be the purpose of the Center for UFO Studies, though it never quite made it that far. Dr. Heineck died in 1986, and though the Center for UFO Studies still exists, today it mostly collects and maintains an archive of UFO reports which is available for use by researchers. Thus far, no organization like Heineck envisioned has materialized. But just maybe it still could. If ever there was a time, I'd say it's now, given the massive surge in UFO interest. Perhaps if enough like-minded people came together with a proper mindset, such a thing could happen. I hope I've adequately demonstrated why I consider J. Allen Heineck to be one of the most important figures in the field of ufology. He spent decades investigating some of the most baffling and important UFO cases in history, both in an official capacity as consultant to the Air Force, as well as privately afterward. But perhaps more importantly, he sought to establish methods and techniques which could be used to investigate UFOs in a scientific manner. I find Heineck to be especially credible given two factors. First are his scientific credentials. 
It is undeniable that Dr. Hynek was a credible scientist given his resume. But second is his personal journey through the UFO world. In the first chapter of the UFO experience, Hynek describes himself as, quote, an innocent bystander who got shot, end quote. He was by no means interested in UFOs when he got involved with Project Sign. He scoffed at the situation like most of his colleagues. It was only through years of research that he gradually changed his position. And even after his so-called turnaround, he never went all in on endorsing one explanation for UFOs or another. I think his example is a valuable one, not only in the case of UFOs, but in all preternatural disciplines. Remain objective. Don't become overly attached to one hypothesis or another. Always seek all of the available evidence, and most importantly, follow where the evidence leads. This is how we determine what is fact and what is myth. I believe that's where we'll wrap this up. We could spend hours going through Hynek's book and reviewing all of the dozens of cases he recounts within it. I highly suggest purchasing a copy and reading it yourself if you feel so inclined. It's one of my favorite books on the topic. It'll also give you more insight on the topics we covered here, as Heineck goes much deeper than the summary I've provided. Oh, and next time you watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind, keep an eye out for Dr. Heineck with his signature pipe. Until I can speak to you all again, stay tuned, stay vigilant, and man the watch.